Hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome back to the second session on the topic we were discussing, international standards on quality management. Uh, we concluded in the first session that there are eight components of a system of quality management, SOQM, versus six elements in the previous ISQC1. And we did conclude it that the two highlighted in yellow are the change, rest is all the same. You must have studied in the ISQC1. Now let's go down, study each one of them, the eight components, which defines the SOQM and uh, will interact more with each component and try making relevance to exam papers as well. I'll be looking at an exam paper which used to come previously with a quality control terminology and now how things will change down from September exams within my interaction of these eight components. Now, this article uh, is available on the website where the technical articles are available for triple A. And in the technical articles, you go down, it's the syllabus area C, quality control and practice management. You click on the syllabus area C and you will find this article right here, International Standards on Quality Management Part 1. So this is an article which is for syllabus area C. And obviously this covers your syllabus, right? This is not a current issue. This is not an emerging issue. This is just a syllabus area. Okay, now moving back to the presentation. Okay, eight components. Let's do them in order. The first one, which is the new one, not used to be there in ISQC1, firm risk assessment process. Now, we're not talking about the audit risk assessment, right? We're not talking about the risk of material misstatements here. We're talking about firm. So that means that we're talking about how does an audit firm assess the risk within the firm, right? Within the firm. This is not an audit risk assessment, right, which you do for the client, because a lot of time when you're interacting with the audit students, wherever they see the term risk assessment, they think, oh, this is an audit risk. This is a risk of material. Said, no, look at the term here. Firm, firm is the audit firm, right? Firm risk assessment process. So how would an audit firm have a risk assessment process within the firm, within the system of quality management to ensure that risk are mitigated and risk are identified? Now, try to understand this before I give you examples. Firm must design and implement. So that's, that's the proactive approach, right? Design and implement a risk assessment process that sets quality objectives and identifies risk. Your focus has to be on quality. Why are you designing and implementing a firm risk assessment process? Because you want to ensure quality at the end of the day. You want to ensure that the risks are identified and mitigated so that the detection risk for the auditor goes down and the credibility of the audit report improves because there are so many risks within the process of the audit, right from the stage you accept a client, there is a risk that you might accept a bad client. Uh, right at the stage of planning, there is a risk that you might not do a good planning. You might not identify the relevant issues within the audit of the financial statements. There is a risk when you're performing the audit that you're not gathering sufficient appropriate audit evidence or you must have delegated a wrong person in a wrong area. For example, you've allocated a junior to a risky area. There is a risk at the stage of completion and finalization that the review was not performed the working papers were not reviewed, etc. There are so many risks within the process through which the audit goes. So as an audit firm, you need to evaluate the risk within the process and you need to identify the mitigations. So to ensure that at the end of the day, the quality of the audit is maintained, the credibility of the audit report is maintained, and the public starts to trust more on the audited financial statement. So an audit firm needs to define a risk assessment process to set the quality benchmarks higher. Let's see what should be part of it. By maintaining a tailored focus on risk and their mitigation, the firm should be able to focus on ensuring the right engagement or the right report is issued. This is the objective, right engagement or the right report is issued for each assignment. Taylor, Taylor, that is a system of quality management, right? Taylor, decide according to the needs of your audit firm. Decide according to the size of your audit firm. So everything has to be tailored. And that's the beauty of the system of quality management. That's the beauty of ISQM1. It's not a box ticking. It's more of a proactive approach. So each firm needs to define a risk assessment process 
Niche firm needs to ensure that at the end of the day, the quality of each engagement is maintained. You are delivering the right engagement and you're delivering the right audit report for each engagement. And to deliver the right audit report, we know audit report is the output. Audit report is the output, right? There are so many inputs, planning, performance, gathering evidence, review of the working papers, that all leads to a good audit report. If there are if, if there are issues in planning, issues in performing, issues in gathering evidence, issues in review and finalization, the audit report is at risk. So you need to understand that the process process is the input, right? Process is the input, the inputs of the audit, the client acceptance, the planning, the gathering of evidence, the review of the working paper, input. And that input results in the audit report uh, audit report is the uh, is the output right so to have a good output you need to ensure that you uh, you assess the risk within the input you overcome the risk within the input that that's extremely important now let's take an example here this may be due to a more competent and a well trained individual performing complex or risky area beautiful if a more competent person, a well-trained person is performing complex areas like a manager, like a supervisor, like a senior. That's wonderful. But if a junior is performing in the exam paper, you will say, no, a junior is not a competent person to perform uh, risky areas because the junior cannot take right judgments, cannot gather the right evidence. And eventually, if the junior is performing the risky areas, that is increasing the detection risk. That is increasing the risk of uh, gathering inappropriate evidence. So such issues have come in the past papers, right? Where a junior has been allocated to a very complex area. So there has to be more competent people, well-trained people on the risky areas, audit partner feeling more empowered to issue modified audit report. That is important because self-interest is a risk. With, with a self-interest in focus, with the risk of losing the client in focus, with the risk of losing the money associated with the client in focus, the audit partners will never be empowered to issue the right reports. Look at this statement. This is very critical statement. This is giving you another dimension of risk. The first risk was an incompetent person performing risky areas. So how you mitigate a risk? By bringing the competent people to risky areas. So try to understand the process. The second is very, very important, right? Audit partners feeling more empowered to issue a modified report. You need to make them empowered. And how will they feel empowered? They will feel empowered when you put self-interest at the back of your mind. You put self-interest uh, as a secondary parameter and you focus on quality of the audit. You focus on uh, issuing the modified reports, not worried about the client auditor relationship, not worried about losing the client. So that empowerment has to come in the audit firm. That culture has to come in the audit firms. That way the partners are empowered. If you evaluate who is a good partner on the basis of how much income is he generating, that will never empower him to issue a modified report. But if you are appraising a partner who is a good partner on the basis of how many right audit reports has he issued, how many uh, modified reports has he issued, that would be a good partner. And that will make him empowered. That will make him empowered that my appraisal is done on the issuance of the right report, not on maintaining the client relationship, not on maintaining the self-interest. So till the time you don't change the culture of the audit firms, things are difficult, right? So audit partners feeling empowered to issue the modified audit reports. Next, by ensuring acceptance procedures fully identify threats to independence and ensure safeguards are enacted and many other factors. When you are accepting a client, consider the ethical issues, consider the ethical risk. Uh, if there is any ethical risk at the time of acceptance, carefully ensure safeguards. Uh, if safeguards are possible, accept a client. If safeguards are not possible, reject a client. There are so many questions in the past paper where the examiner asks you, evaluate the methods in considering whether to accept a client or not. So that acceptance decisions also have risk. You have to ensure that those risks are mitigated for the acceptance to go on. 
But again, if you just look at acceptance from a monetary angle, you believe that whatever issues are there in acceptance, we just need to catch on the client to get money. That would be wrong against quality management. So in the process of audit, uh, whether you are at the planning stage, you are at the performing stage, you are at the review stage, you are at the acceptance of a client stage, or the audit partner has to issue a modified report and he feels threatened to issue a modified report because he believes the firm will lose income and he's not issuing a modified report. Such risk needs to be mitigated from the process of the audit firm. And that is where risk assessment becomes a more proactive approach here. So each firm needs to sit down, the partners in the firms have to sit down, look at the process of the audit and ensure that at every stage of the audit process, quality management is implemented to ensure the risks are mitigated. And at the end of the day, a good audit report, at the right audit report is issued, right? So in, in an exam question, if you believe that the partner uh, is focusing on self-interest to issue the wrong opinion, that will be a quality management issue. If you believe the wrong person is uh, being put in the risky area, that is a quality management issue. If you believe that you have not overcome the ethical issues and still you have accepted a client, that is a quality management issue under the risk assessment process. So a firm risk assessment process is the new introduction under the quality management system, which used not to be in the quality control standards before. So I hope that is understandable. There's nothing unusual in this discussion, right? This all relates to your AAA syllabus. This all relates to your understanding of the AAA syllabus. Okay, now moving onwards to the next phenomena. Governance and leadership. This, this used to be in ISQC1, right? Leadership was, was in the uh, ISQC1 as well. So nothing new. And we know the tone of the, the, the role of the leader, the role of the partners in an audit firm is extremely important. This should ensure the tone at the top enforces a commitment to quality and ethics across the whole firm. This is extremely important, right? For everything to work in the SOQM, your SOQM will fail if the tone at the top is not right. And your SOQM will be delivering results, will, will make the partners empowered to issue a modified report, will will make everything robust in your quality management systems if the tone at the top believes in quality if the tone at the top believes in quality takes precedence over self interest but if it is a vice versa that the self interest takes precedence over quality control everything will collapse we are not discussing the realistic audits the bad practices in realistic audits that's that's a true story public trust have been shattered just because of these bad practices taking taking place in the prior history, uh, fr from in the prior history, if you speak of the last 10, 12, 15 years, there have been lots of bad practices where the audit firms have been negligent of the bad practices. But this standard has come to make things better for the auditor and the public trust the uh, the the public has on the auditor. G leadership, right? Systems and policies. That is where proactive approach comes in, right? Every firm needs to define their systems and policies should be in place to reward commitment to quality rather focusing on client retention and engagement. This is what I was just discussing on the previous point as well, right? Rewarding commitment, not rewarding how much income have you generated. Because if you reward income generated, you're collapsing the system of SOQM if you are rewarding how much clients have been retained, you're collapsing the system of SOQM. But if you're rewarding commitment, if you're rewarding the right deliverance, if you're rewarding the right due care, if you're rewarding the right use of skeptical mindset, or if you're rewarding the right challenging mindset, that is wonderful for the system to go on. The last point, this should allow the partner to challenge client judgment without a fear of a negative consequence, right? Or losing the client. So you need to empower, you need to empower the leadership. You need to set the right tone where the leadership feels empowered to take the right decisions in the right context, not just taking decisions where you are protecting the income, where you're protecting the self-interest. And, and even in ISQC1, we used to talk about that if self-interest is dominating, 
there is no quality right so you need to ensure that the consequences the negative consequences are put at the back of your mind and you move and you look forward into into performing better quality audits so governance and leadership is important right systems are important the role of the leadership is important in setting the tone so if you're reading a case and you find the partner is not setting the right culture or the partner is not portraying the right tone or the partner is uh, asking the audit team to conceal something and issue the report that is where the tone at the top becomes bad i, I believe there was a question if i if i'm not wrong in december 16 paper i guess there was a question on gul company and um, no sorry there, there was a question on northwest company i believe uh, on professional skepticism northwest company was the name of the question and uh, i think the group uh, the group audit partner was trying to intimidate the subsidiary auditors and saying to the subsidiary auditor that leave aside things and issue the issue the unmodified opinion. And such questions have come in past paper where the partner tries to intimidate the team, influence the team to hide things, conceal things, and telling the team, I, I've seen everything, you don't worry about it, just ignore it, and let's let's issue an unmodified opinion. If that is the case in the question, you are you are hitting the leadership. And you're saying this leadership is compromising the quality management. So in the case, there will be issues just like the previous questions, right? And you need to identify that whether this issue compromise the quality management, whether this issue is against quality management. So you are not using the word quality control anywhere in your answers now. You're using the word quality management in your answer. Issue remains the same. Finding the issue, telling why it is an issue, uh, explaining the implication of the issues, which I'm just discussing with you currently. And, and in your answers, now don't use the word quality control, rather you're using the word quality management in the answer. Please, that is a very important change. Otherwise, examiner will say the student do does not know that the term control is obsolete now. Okay, moving on to the next third, relevant ethical requirements. We know a question on ethics, ethical and professional issues is a very common phenomena in the AAA paper. We get, uh, we get ethical issue questions, we get ethical and professional issue questions. We get a bundled question, ethical, professional, and quality management issues together. So you know that in an ethical question, you need to investigate the ethical issues, uh, you need to identify the threats, you need to justify why it is a threat and then take a proper safeguard. So the, the, the importance under the quality management is that a firm should go beyond IESBA code of conduct. This bullet here. Relevant ethical requirements for a firm depends on the jurisdiction it operates in. These may go beyond, these may go beyond those set out in IESBA. The firm should devise their own policies. For example, if IESBA tells us that gifts and hospitality, which are trivial, which are insignificant, should be accepted. But the firm may devise a policy, whatever the value of gift is, or whatever the value of hospitality is, it should not be accepted. Now, the firm policy is to be followed because we know the international standards on uh, the international ethical standards, the code, the code itself is a principle-based approach, right? The code is not a rule here, right? The code is not telling you this is what you have to do. Otherwise, you will be penalized. No. So the firm has to find something beyond the code. The code is giving you a guidance, just like the ISQM is giving you. But still, the ISQM is saying, devise your own policies, define your own systems. That's, that's more important. So you need to understand the structure here. So firms has to go beyond. They have to set their own rules for gifts and hospitality, for example. They have to set their own rules for familiarity. They have to set their own rules for rotation. For example, there, there is a rule that the partner has to be rotated after seven years. A firm may say, no, we need to be more uh, careful. The partner has to be rotated after five years. Now, the firm policy will dominate the code of conduct. So that is important. That is extremely important. So safeguards can come from the firm policies. The safeguard can come from the firm systems, which can be better in terms of your uh, audit firm, size of your audit firm, complexity of your audit firm. So 
complying with ethical requirements, making a system of compliance, making policies of the firm for complying with ethical standards, safeguards is extremely important. And you're pretty much good in this area as AAA students, right? Next, acceptance and continuation. We know a question uh, comes separately on practice management area, which is syllabus area C, and you find questions, ex examiner asking you, evaluate the matters which you should consider in deciding whether to accept the audit of an XYZ company or not. So when you're accepting a client, when you're accepting a new relationship with a client, or you are continuing a client, you are continuing the existing relationship because it's not just about accepting, it's about continuation. So acceptance is the first time, right? Continuation is thereafter for a number of years till the time your relationship with the client gets bad. Now, a separate question too comes on this, right? But it could be part of a scenario uh, on quality management, professional issues and ethical issues where you are going with issues and you and you believe some decisions on acceptance have been taken with haste or some decisions on acceptance has been taken, uh, taken just keeping in mind the self-interest uh, even though the client was risky, even though there was negative results of client screening, still we have accepted a client. You will criticize that, right? You will justify that this is against quality management, but accepting a client, just focusing on self-interest. Now, this is just a recap of things you already know. Bullet number one, quickly. Firm must assess the integrity, right? Client screening and the ethical values of the client and its management. That, that's what we do at the start, right? We do assess the client screening. We do assess the results of the client screening. We do assess, is there any negative indicators in client screening like bribery, corruption, money laundering, tax evasion, anything the client is doing bad, anything which we should know right at the front, rejecting the client, not even accepting it. So integrity, screening, uh, the indicators, negative indicators, putting a question mark on the client's integrity is to be investigated very carefully. Number two bullet, the SOQM should ensure that the firm financial and operational priorities do not lead to inappropriate judgments. Financial and operational priorities do not lead to inappropriate judgments. You don't have competence, you don't have resources, and you still say, I'm accepting a client operational. When you have when you don't have resources and competence, you cannot accept a new client or financial. You cannot just accept a client because you're getting money, even though you, even though the client has negative risk, even though the client is involved in money laundering, even though the client is involved in tax evasion, even though the results of the client integrity is wrong. So financial and operational areas have to be considered very carefully before you accept the client. You cannot just say, okay, I'm getting the money, leave aside, uh, the client is good, I'm accepting it. You're not even performing the co correspondence with the previous auditor. You're not even uh, investigating the client integrity. You're simply looking at the money and saying, okay, let's accept it. So financial and operational priorities do not lead to inappropriate judgments when you're accepting a client. Bullet number three, Existing business relationships. What about your existing client? In the first and the second bullet, we were talking about accepting a new client. But what about existing clients? The relationship with the existing client should be reassessed at the start of each new year. Every time you're about to start the new audit of an existing client, reassess the relationship. Because every year you need to be reappointed as an auditor. This may mean performing fresh identity checks. Every year, the identity checks, integrity checks needs to be re-performed because within a span of a year, things can change. The client was good, but within a span of one year, it has become bad. The client was not doing money laundering three years ago, but it's doing now. So a lot of times the student thinks that uh, the integrity checks are performed in the first year of the audit. No, it's something regular. It has to go every year at the start of the audit, at the start of the new year engagement, sorry. Reperformance of independence, declaration of employees, and reevaluating conflicts of interest and competence. Every year, you will recheck the independence. Every year, you will recheck that the audit team is independent. You will take declarations from them. Every year you will take declarations from them that they are independent. You will perform the identity checks. You will evaluate whether there are any conflicts of interest, any, any uh, conflict of interest of your existing client with a competitor. 
uh, it could be possible in in the last one year you have taken on the audit of a competitor which creates a conflict of interest with your existing client and competence every year you need to reassess your competence are you competent enough to deliver further audits so this para 3 normally the student thinks this is done for the first year audit but this is to be done for existing clients as well because each year this is to be reassessed if you want the system of quality management to work effectively and the last bullet it will also involve assessing whether new information had it been known at the point of acceptance would be prevented the firm from accepting the client because see in a passage of one year two year three year when you're serving the client you, new information will emerge so when you accepted the client things were good but a new information about the client came in after you have accepted them which is very bad information so you need to think about your future relationship with the client. Will you continue with the client after the first year of the audit or after the second year of the audit? So new information can emerge anytime and you need to think about the possible consequences of that new information on your possible client auditor relationship. So this is acceptance and continuation as a component of quality management and as a separate question in an exam paper in the AAA context. So we have covered the firm risk assessment process so far. We've down covered the leadership and governance. We've now covered acceptance and continuation and even the ethical requirements. So four of them has gone out of the list of eight. We're remaining with four more elements. So let's wind up the session here and come back with the third and the final one, looking at the element number five, six, seven, eight, and connecting them with what examiner can put into the exam context and a final look at an exam question. Take good care of yourself and I'll be back with the third session on ISQM1 just to ensure that you maintain interest in each of these sessions. Goodbye and Allah Hafiz.